September 1944. Arnhem and the Allies' imaginative attempt to end World War II quickly failed. The rapid advance from the Normandy beachhead was checked and it was to be more than four months before the Allies could resume full-scale operations against Germany. For well, now, with the Normandy beaches over 300 miles away, supply problems were pressing and new port facilities were desperately needed. Allied armies were virtually halted until Antwerp was opened and could only tidy the line. While the Allies marked time, Hitler rallied and struck back in the Ardennes. Not until mid-January 1945 was order restored. Only then could the Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower, think of returning to the offensive. He would start with a succession of three major assaults to advance to the west bank of the Rhine. After crossing the river, the vital manufacturing industries of the Ruhr would be cut off to deprive Germany of the means to fight on. The first of Eisenhower's three assaults, a pincer move, was to be by Montgomery's 21st Army Group, with the US 9th Army attacking across the river Ruhr in Operation Grenade, and the 1st Canadian Army striking southeast between the rivers Rhine and Maas in Operation Veritable. The first moves in the battle for the Rhineland. Frustrating though the four-month delay since Arnhem had been, it did allow plenty of time for planning. The build-up and concentration for Operation Veritable was a tribute to thorough and accurate staff work. Secrecy demanded that virtually all supplies were moved forward, dumped and camouflaged by night, and the quantities involved were immense. Ordnance alone was of mind-boggling proportions, as General Creerer, the 1st Canadian Army's commander, observed at the time. If the ammunition allotment for this operation, which consists of 350 types, were stacked side by side and five foot high, it would line a road for 30 miles. Roads to the front were few and in poor shape, so over 600 kilometers had to be built or reconditioned and many bridges constructed. Even then, they only stood up to the constant pounding because the ground was frozen hard. In all, some 340,000 people were involved, more than in Britain's armed services today. But at the end of January, their luck changed when a thaw set in, and with movements at a peak of 10,000 tons a day, the roads began to break up. Superhuman efforts were required to avert a near catastrophe, and superhuman efforts were forthcoming. Somehow, in just three weeks, everything was ready. Operation Veritable would strike here, but as the formations gathered in the vast 74 by 69 kilometer concentration area, all movements, gun positions, security arrangements, signals traffic and carefully orchestrated bogus activities conformed to an elaborate cover plan to convince the enemy commanders that the offensive would strike north. But Field Marshal von Rundstedt, Commander-in-Chief West, and General Blaskowitz, the Army Group Commander, saw the industrial roar as the obvious strategic objective. They therefore expected to be attacked here and concentrated their reserves accordingly. General Schlem, the first parachute army's commander, thought differently. Patrol reports had convinced him that the Allied offensive would come in his sector and, contrary to orders, he moved part of the reserves further north. 
Montgomery wanted the British 30 Corps under General Horrocks to carry out Operation Veritable and placed it under command of General Creera's 1st Canadian Army. Before it lay three seemingly formidable prepared defensive positions of the German West Wall, some 30 kilometers in depth. The forward defense line, the so-called Siegfried line, and the Schlieffen position, or Hochfeld Leyback, as the Allies called it. Though each of these was up to 1,500 metres in depth, with anti-tank ditches, trenches, barbed wire entanglements and minefields, they had been hastily prepared under non-military control and had none of the vast concrete obstacles and emplacements found further south. The main defences were strengthened by subsidiary lines and the Rhineland towns were ringed with extensive field fortifications. The assaults would be made between the Rhine and Maas to avoid a river crossing, but faced considerable geographical constraints. Seasonal floods had been swollen because the Germans had blown the retaining dikes, restricting the front available to some eight kilometers, and the floodwaters were rising fast. Rapid movement could not be expected in the dense forest of the Reichswald, other ground was mainly low-lying and waterlogged, and there were only two good roads. In spite of all this, and because of Canadian pressure, Horrocks would attack with five divisions, rather than the three originally planned. The main thrust by the 15th Scottish Division would be towards Cleve, over the relatively dry ground between the forest and the floods. The 2nd Canadian Division would open up the main road behind the Scots, and the high ground in the Reichswald, dominating the route, would be taken by the 53rd Welsh Division. The 3rd Canadian Division was to clear the flooded area, and the 51st Highland Division would open up the other good road. Ready in reserve were the 43rd Wessex and Guards Armoured Divisions. Horrocks' top priority was to seize this high ground, the Matterborn feature, before the arrival of German reserves. He saw it as the key to a successful breakthrough, for it dominated Cleve and the more favorable country beyond, and once captured, he would send in his two reserve divisions. Both divisions would bypass Cleve. The 43rd Wessex Division would drive south to Goch and Gelden, and the Guards' Armoured Division towards Wesel, where he hoped it might capture a bridge over the Rhine intact. At the same time, the 15th Scottish Division, after capturing Cleve, would push on to Kalkar. Horrocks hoped to see his armour speeding across hard, frozen ground and capturing its objectives before the Germans could organise their defence in a short, sharp battle of about four days. But the ground wasn't frozen. There was no alternative plan, and much would depend on tracks like this a main divisional axis, remaining usable until the main roads were opened up. The start of Operation Veritable was fixed for February the 8th, and the preceding five nights saw the units of 30 Corps moving to their final assembly areas. It was a remarkable piece of organization, for crammed behind the lines were 60,000 troops, 500 tanks, 500 special-to-task armoured vehicles, the Funnies, and over 1,000 guns, with a further 15,000 troops and 500 tanks in reserve. A sledgehammer to crack a nut. For facing them were just 12,000 unsuspecting Germans supported by a mere 100 guns and 36 self-propelled assault guns. In the air, the Allies were virtually unopposed. The line was held here by the German 84th Infantry Division, with 10,000 troops, poorly equipped and trained, mostly elderly or very young, in contrast to the 2,000 troops of the 2nd Parachute Regiment in this sector, who were well equipped, well trained and highly motivated. On the eve of the battle, the men of 30 Corps, their morale high, watched, waited and tried to snatch some sleep. 
while overhead Allied air power struck at the Rhineland. Its roads, railways, bridges, supply dumps and towns. Cleve was almost completely destroyed. For Horrocks, in an attempt to reduce casualties, had chosen to have it taken out by heavy bombers. Then, at 0500 hours, BBC. This is Chef Wilmot speaking from a hill looking down into Germany. Everything's firing today, as perhaps you'll have gathered. Not only the regular guns, but what the gunners call the pepper pot, made up of hack ack guns, tank guns, anti-tank guns, heavy machine guns, that just spray the German defences and add to the uh, discomfort. And those shells have been crashing down on German pillboxes and gun positions, mortar positions, headquarters, roads, concentration areas and so on. These have been pounded by well over a thousand guns. It was the biggest artillery bombardment yet of the Northwest European campaign. It lasted five and a half hours. Then, at 10.30 hours, infantry and armor crossed the start lines. It had started to rain. They moved slowly through the mud. It was over their boot tops. Mud that sucked their feet back, lead and clinging mud that wrapped itself round their boots and made, made every step slow and heavy. But even so, there was purpose in their step. The Canadian army was really attacking into Germany for the first time. Come on, backwards, up front. In spite of these conditions, the infantry by and large made good progress and kept pace with their barrages. devastating artillery fire had cut all enemy line communications and prevented the use of runners. German troops were found overwhelmed and demoralized. The majority only too happy to surrender. For the armor, it was a very different story, for the waterlogged ground soon gave way and the majority bogged and blocked the routes. But a few tanks, and the all-important funnies, the special armour, did manage to struggle forward to make crossings over anti-tank ditches and trenches, and to flame out the few pockets of enemy resistance. Perched high in his command post, Horrocks must have had considerable misgivings as he surveyed the quagmire. Nevertheless, by 1830 hours, the main anti-tank ditch of the Siegfried Line was reached only an hour behind schedule. The next phase was to be a set-piece assault by a special breaching force, but this was 16 kilometers away as traffic congestion had delayed its departure from Nijmegen, and now ahead of the 290 heavy vehicles lay a sea of mud. It was bitterly cold and raining hard. dark, overhanging branches fouled bridging equipment, which dropped and blocked the way forward. Mud was now too deep to cross, so diversions had to be found and cleared. Men dug, vehicles pushed, pulled and towed. And eventually, at 0400 hours on day two, seven hours behind schedule, the assault began. But in the night, there had been three crucial developments. A patrol had crossed the line of the anti-tank ditch without noticing it and found this village unoccupied. A bridge on the main road was captured intact and the advance was now here. And in the forest, the defences had been easily crossed five hours earlier. Yet these successes went unexploited and the set-piece assault against the now outflanked position went ahead as planned it was easily overcome. The 
the speed of the advance was now aided by another funny, the kangaroo. A turretless tank which served as a primitive armoured personnel carrier and which transported the leading infantry to take the high ground here. Another battalion seized this area. It was 1700 hours on day two, 11 hours later than planned, but the key hills of the Matterborn feature had been captured, just half an hour before the first few German reinforcements started to arrive. The spearhead of Operation Veritable was at a crucial stage, but what had been happening elsewhere? The 53rd Welsh Division had captured all its objectives in the Reichswald by the morning of day two. And from the forest edge, its tanks opened fire on enemy vehicles moving up to Cleve. Opposition had been light, casualties few, but now movement into and through the forest was almost impossible. Further operations were cancelled while urgent efforts were directed to route maintenance, for the weather, not the enemy, had halted the division literally in its tracks. The second Canadian division had met considerable resistance here and could not open the main road forward until 20, 30 hours on day one, four hours behind schedule. The division was now temporarily withdrawn from the battle. By far the toughest fighting was experienced by the 51st Highland Division. It unexpectedly encountered resistance here from an enemy battalion moved forward on the night before the offensive. Nevertheless, after 36 hours, it was firmly established in the forest and was across the second vital main road. On the other flank, artillery fired smoke during day one to conceal 30 corps activities from the enemy. Then, as night fell, the 3rd Canadian Division advanced towards the villages isolated in the floods. Nicknamed the Water Rats, their operations were made possible by these amphibious tracked vehicles. Yet another invaluable allied funny, the Buffalo capable of carrying personnel or light vehicles and armed with machine guns and any other weapons their commanders could lay their hands on. Maintaining direction in the dark wasn't easy, but one commander solved the problem by calling for a stonk on the objective and following the resulting fires. In the shallow water, anti-personnel mines and wire played havoc with the tracks. Currents quickened as the floods rose, but targets were strafed, infantry was landed, and the villages cleared one by one. But to return to the main thrust, the 15th Scottish Division had captured the two hills dominating the Matterborn Ridge but signalled that it had cleared the entire feature. Horrocks promptly ordered forward his 1st Reserve Division, the 43rd Wessex. Because of the movement difficulties elsewhere, the 15th Division's main axis was already choked with all manner of vehicles as well as its own. Flood waters covered the road in places and threatened to cut it completely. And now in the cold and rain of the second night, the 43rd Division advanced along it towards the Matterborn. Not surprisingly, the first 11 kilometers took five hours. In the meantime, no orders had been issued and no attempts made by either the 15th or the 53rd Divisions to extend the grip on the vital ridge. So that when the head of the 43rd Division's column reached this area, it learned from the 15th Division's reconnaissance regiment that the bypass route was strongly defended, but that Cleve itself was only lightly held. So its leading brigade, the 129th, was ordered to continue the advance through the outskirts of the town instead. 
At 05.30 hours on the third day, it had reached this area. It was unopposed, but ordered to halt, for behind in Cleve, chaos reigned. While picking a way through the mass of craters and rubble caused by the Allied bombing, the brigade ran into small groups of enemy reinforcements moving up. No tidy battles were possible, and much depended on the initiative of individual platoon and section commanders. Some beat off counterattacks. Others cleared houses. One, in the absence of a forward observation officer, improvised directions to bring down artillery fire on an enemy gun position. Others saw no action at all. It was all very patchy and confused. No more so than on the main road to Cleve, where the 15th and 43rd divisions had become hopelessly entangled in what was probably World War II's biggest traffic jam. It lasted all day and left both divisions' follow-up brigades in complete disarray, as well as preventing the reserve brigades of both divisions moving forward. Fortunately, the Allies controlled the airspace. It was a day for calm, rational thought. But cold, wet, tired and frustrated, commanders blew their tops. It didn't help. So what was the situation for General Horrocks at last light on the third day? After successfully surprising the enemy, Operation Veritable had started well in spite of the appalling weather. And until the second night, von Rundstedt and Blaskowitz were still not convinced it was the main Allied attack. So in spite of the time wasted assaulting the outflanked Siegfried line, 30 Corps had reached the Matterborn feature before the German Army Group reserves had been committed. But the failure to gain complete control of the routes through the Matterborn area, together with the premature use of the 43rd Wessex Division on a shared axis, saw one brigade isolated in Cleve with the remainder of 30 Corps' main punch paralyzed by the traffic jam on a route itself threatened by the rising floods. In the Reichswald, the 53rd Welsh Division was still trying to solve its movement problems, and only on the flanks were the 3rd Canadian and 51st Highland Divisions making some progress. But Operation Veritable was only one half of the 21st Army Group's pincer move. 48 hours after the start of Veritable, the US 9th Army should have attacked across the River Rohr in Operation Grenade. But this was impossible, because the Germans had carried out skillful denial operations on the dams upstream to flood the river. With the Americans for the time being unable to attack, the Germans could concentrate on Operation Veritable, and the 1st Canadian Army would have to fight on alone. 